I love my country, but it can be a tough place to grow old. And here to talk to us about that now is a nationally recognized expert in retirement security. Teresa Ghilarducci is a labor economist. She is a professor of economics at the New School for Social Research and is the director of the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis and the New School's Retirement Equity Lab, or ReLab. She also writes a great deal on and very insightfully on these issues, and she joins us now. Teresa, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you bet. And and you've written a couple of interesting pieces I wanted to discuss with you recently. One was for The Atlantic, one was for Slate. But let's start with The Atlantic, a piece uh, headlined How the Government Underestimated the Extent of Income Inequality. Um, briefly, uh, just let us know what your, your thesis was there. Sure. Um, so both of the articles you're referring to, is what I was obsessed with this um, Christmas break. Um, and that is of uh, the coming um, crisis in retirement measured in a really particular way, which is uh, the numbers of um, people who are going to be poor, near poor, and old. Um, I don't think people realize that the rate of poverty among the elderly is increasing, and the numbers of people who will be elderly is increasing. So put those two increases together and you have tens of millions of people who are old and needy than we've ever seen before. Um, And one of the reasons for that is that the social security system is a great system. It's kept a lot of people out of poverty, but given the failure of the employer pension system, it should have been expanding and should be uh, having a lot more money than it does now over the past 40 years. And one of the reasons why Social Security does not have the money it needs to keep benefits stable or to expand benefits is because the government did not anticipate back in the 1980s that we would have such a huge growth in income inequality. And why income inequality hurts Social Security is um, technical but real. Would you like me to talk about the reason why earnings inequality has hurt Social Security? Yeah, absolutely. Before we do, I just want to let the listeners know that the last time, when you mentioned the 1980s, that the last time Social Security was uh, recalibrated uh, was in the early 1980s, the Greenspan Commission, uh, Ronald Reagan was president, Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House, and uh, basically they reset the funding for Social Security. There are just two things I want people to understand going in. One is we knew how many baby boomers there were in 1983 because they'd all been born by then. Um, So really they set the numbers right, but what they didn't, they thought, however, that, and and, and you'll elaborate on this hopefully, but they thought they had set the numbers so that 90% of income in this country would be covered by the payroll tax because they, as you just said, they weren't anticipating inequal- the extent to which inequality would in- increase, right? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'll just even slow that down a little bit um, because okay. um, I want everybody to be able to tell their friends <laughs> what right. happened. Good. Um, so we have an earnings cap on Social Security, but not Medicare. Um, so all earnings up to a certain level are taxed at the regular Social Security rate, but all the earnings after that certain level um, is not. Um, And that's because high income earners don't get such a high um, proportion of their um, pre-retirement earnings, their earnings back in social security. And so so the benefit structure Mm -hmm. is pretty progressive. And so the whole structure of the system was to not tax all the income um, uh, under social security to kind of not take too much away for high earners. Right. There was a concern that it be balanced. And in 1980s, all the government economists had was the past, you know, to look at what might happen to all those baby boomers' earnings as we go forward. And they figured out that what ha- would happen in the future is what happened in the past, is that all levels of, of workers, high earners and, and um, low earners, would get a, about... Um, the same shares of the country's wealth. If productivity was going to go up by 4%, the assumption was that low and high earners' income would go up about 
three to four percent every year. But what happened is they did not imagine the sea change and that people in the top 10 percent would get almost all the increases in total earnings. And that meant that cap, which in 2016 is one hundred and eighteen thousand five hundred dollars, meaning all the income earned above one hundred and eighteen thousand five hundred dollars would not be taxed for Social Security revenue purposes. So what I did for the Atlantic the first week of January was to calculate how many multimillionaires stopped paying the first week of January. It was a kind of a fun exercise because I could calculate what rich person stopped um, paying Social Security taxes after his hangover, you know, was resolved or (laughs) pass lunch, you know, on January 1st or pass their first work week back, you know, January 4th. It was a fun exercise. I was kind of wasting a lot of time. But, you know, the (laughs) point was, is that a handful of very wealthy people have now, what is it, January 14th, have stopped paying Social Security taxes. Right. And since they won't pay for the rest of the year, that loses billions of dollars into the Social Security system. Now, they'll continue to pay Medicare tax, but they stopped paying Social Security tax this week because we have not raised the cap to reflect the new reality that earnings and um, earnings have been so skewed to the top. Well, so I hope that everybody listening can explain that to their friends. Yeah, and I should tell you that our regular listeners are very familiar with the payroll tax cap, okay. but but you you've broadened the you've given us a broader tent of of understanding for that. So thanks. And um, uh, let me ask you, uh, Teresa Gilarducci. Uh, so if we were to remove the payroll tax cap, what would Social Security's long term financial picture look like then? Okay, so you have to listen to me carefully because um, reforming Social Security is like a Chinese menu. And if you don't pick the right uh, menu, um, then the conclusions are right. So here's my menu. You eliminate the earnings cap on Social Security like we have for Medicare. And you do not increase proportionally the benefits going to the high-income people. If you do that, raise the cap completely. Right. Don't raise benefits for high-income people, you have completely solved the Social Security solvency problem, which means we, if we do nothing, we won't be able to pay um, one-fourth of benefits by 2042. We've completely solved that problem. We've made it solvent for the next 75 years, and we have some money left over to eliminate most poverty among Social Security recipients. And if that doesn't sound like a big deal, let me punctuate with my my sentence by saying that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, okay, well, then uh, that's no, maybe it's not. I I was thinking uh, and perhaps you're more familiar with the research than I am. But I I think that Josh Bivens, another economist, had done work on this and thought felt we, we could get most of the way to closing the shortfall, but not all of the way. But maybe he wasn't looking at limiting yeah, the benefits. He was, he, he was adding a little bit of, um, I don't know, chili peppers or shrimp to his menu. <laughs> okay. In um, other words, most, he was uh, increasing so, but, benefits for the very wealthy a little bit. Or so, I mean, what you did, yeah, exactly. What he did was say, and we'll, um, we'll, under the, we'll keep the current formula the same and start raising benefits for Bill Gates. Uh, and that might be politically the right thing to do. I'm not debating the politics. I'm just doing the math. Right. If you don't raise the benefits for high income people, uh, and I could justify it because they get tax breaks elsewhere or something, but that's the politicians justify the position. Right. And, math, and by the way, so do I. Yeah. So do uh, you know? And I'm not a politician, but you know, my argument is that given the the massive increase in wealth inequality in this country, it's a sort of writing of the scales, uh, a yeah, rebalance. Yeah. And that is a political, I and mean, that really right. is wiser people than me, which are actually the voters, you know, that they can decide what's what's fair. The math is, is that if we do for Social Security what we do for Medicare, we solve the solvency problem. Well, I think that's an, and then some. And, and uh, yes. And, and I think that's a really important finding. So thanks for explaining that to us, Teresa Gilarducci. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about was you wrote another piece for the Times, actually. I, I think it was on a, you co authored 
on a smarter plan to make retirement savings last. I mean, I have a number of Teresa Ghilarducci peaches around my desktop, but this is this is the other one I got open. Uh, and that is a new proposal for something called a guaranteed retirement account. Right, and it's a proposal that's been around for a while. Right. Um, it is now just punctuated and updated. In 2008, um, when I proposed it, and remember what was happening in 2008, we had the financial crisis. Um, the New York Times named it as one of the best economic ideas of 2008 in December, meaning that it was a great idea in, um, with response to the financial crisis. In um, October, we saw 401ks turn into 201ks. It's a clever remark. It's not it's not original to me, right. um, but most people saw a significant decline in their 401ks. And then they filled out sentences that said, hey, is the 401k platform really the best way for me to save for my retirement? Meaning that I have to financialize what really is insurance. Um, is it the best way for me to, um, to save money in case the market goes down, that means I have to save about 30% more than I would if it was in a guaranteed account. And do I have to save uh, even more money on the off chance? And 15% of people who are 65 have the off chance of reaching the age of 90. Do I have to save for that too? Or um, would I propose that a guaranteed retirement account is more of an insurance pool where everybody pools their contributions they're not able to take it out before retirement. Um, they get, they take it out as an annuity. And therefore, if you are one of those lucky people who live into 90, you'll have money for the rest of your life. Because um, it's a guaranteed benefit. It's a guaranteed benefit. So now you won't get rich on my plan. You'll only get a, uh, a guaranteed rate of return. And that will, that will fluctuate according to the trustee's ability to kind of smooth um, the earnings. Um, but, it, you know, what? it'll never be sexy. Um, no, I, it, it will never be sexy. <laughs> I, I guess, and, and I think I might have shared this with you, uh, uh, the, the employer would pay in under your plan, the employee would pay in, yeah. uh, um, it would be portable, but I saw it more, at, not as a replacement for the 401k, but as a replacement for the old defined benefit pension plans that corporations yeah. used to good offer. Point. Yeah, that's a really good, yeah, we did um, correspond. It's a you know what it is, and I've been describing this a little bit better. Most people, almost all, are in much better shape for their retirement purposes if they're in a defined benefit plan. Right. There are problems with it. You know, as Hank Aaron from the Brookings Institution calls it, it wasn't all beer and Skittles you know, when we had right. um, a defined benefit system. But it met that design met the requirements for a good system people automatically had to save for their retirement and their employers helped. The investment of, um, of the savings were pooled, the fees were low, the risks were smoothed out over time, and the distribution of the, of the benefits was mostly in an annuity. So there's only three things you need in a good retirement system. A good way to accumulate, a good way to invest, and a really good way to distribute um, the accumulation, and that's an annuity. And so 401ks didn't have any of those factors. The design of the system right. meant that a lot of people didn't accumulate enough. It, it was invested ridiculously into these retail funds, liquid funds, and the disaccumulation was a lump sum that people bought a red truck in, not right. you know a lifelong. Right. And, and absolutely, no, no, I think those are all great points. I think my initial reaction to the plan when it was kind of re- uh, when it resurfaced in the Times, I, it, my, I think my initial reaction was tempered when I changed my a little bit when I changed my thinking to that it's really a replacement for the uh, the old pen, corporate yeah. pension plans. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it maybe felt a little complicated. My biggest concern, to be honest with you, Teresa, w was that it might the politicians might glom onto it as a reason not to strengthen and expand social security. Yeah. Oh, you know, I am too. Um, and my co-author and I um, had a paragraph to really punch home the point that it was complementary to and expand a social security system. It would work, it would not work without an expanded social security system. And then we had a couple of lines 
that said how to expand the social security system. And the editor in a small piece said it was just too complicated. It was already a pretty complicated piece. Right. Um, but the responses are so different than they were in, in um, 2008. I really need to tell your listeners this. In 2008, people were really worried that it would displace the 401k system. There's none of that anymore. People are done with the 401k system, even employers. Employers don't like dealing with the brokers, don't like giving um, their employees plans that aren't appropriate, and the employees know that they're really, really risky. So nobody was standing up to defend the 401k system. You know, They weren't afraid that it would displace that. They were afraid that it was going to take away from the momentum to expand Social Security. Right. So we learned our lesson and now we are promoting the plan as an add-on account to a stronger Social Security system. Perfect. Well, I I, I think that's uh, I think that's a, the exactly the right way to position it. So I'm glad I brought it up, and uh, I want to thank you, Teresa Gilarducci, for coming on the program. Teresa Gilarducci, labor economist, expert in retirement security, and writer on these issues. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for your support and calling out my writing because it's hard. So thank you. <laughs>